for me the, the real issue is to make more opportunities for those who want to really focus on science and less on an academic career. Each year at the Lindau meetings in Germany, young researchers come together to learn from Nobel Prize winners as well as from each other. I'm working to understand some of the fundamental processes that are involved in many, many cancers to define how cancer will develop and how malignant cancer cells will become. I've been designing materials that are able to bind to radioactive atoms. And then when these materials are injected into the bloodstream, they specifically seek out and bind to bone tumors. The hope being that this might be a new form of therapy for a children's bone cancer. But there's much more to the meetings in Lindau than seeking scientific collaboration. They also inspire discussion about wider questions in science. Most scientists believe that the crucial discoveries will come from the universities they work in. But Eric Betzig's Nobel Prize came not from his university research, but from his work in industry. I'm very excited to meet Eric Betzig and to hear his perspective and how he came up with, the, with this amazing discovery of uh, you know, changing the way that we think of microscopy and, and the, the barriers that, that he has overcome. And I'm especially interested to hear how him uh, leaving academia and having this very different perspective on science has helped him to actually make this discovery in the end. So your talk had a lot of biology images in it, and your background is in physics, and you got the prize in chemistry. So do you consider yourself a chemist or a physicist or a tool builder ultimately? Well, I'm definitely not a chemist anyway. <laughs> so so uh, when, when I learned about the prize in Munich, and then when I came home the next day, my group had made a big poster with my face on it and okay. said, congratulations, Eric Betzig, <clears throat> Nobel laureate in chemistry. And then it had a quote from the interview that the Nobel Foundation did with me the previous day. I know no chemistry, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's so much serendipity that goes into these discoveries. And was that also the case for you? Did you feel to like... To a ridiculous were... degree. Oh, really? I think there's an alternative universe not far from here where I am an unemployed mechanical engineer. <laughs> if everything initiative. hadn't fallen into place. Oh, and it all fell into place in about one month. One month set, not just, you know, and I thought, I honestly thought I was going to be stocking shelves in a Walmart three, year, three months earlier, you know, that I had completely blown, you know, all aspects of my career, but, but uh, it all fell in place just like that. I was making a list of the Nobel Prize winners before I came here, because we got told that if you meet one, you've got to know what they won for. And some of them, by reading what it was, I'd put them into one category, but then when I actually looked, it was another category. Yeah. Especially with chemistry. So. And on the other way, the uh, super resolution microscope. Yeah. This is all physics, yeah. but the but prize went for chemistry, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. So would you be the super resolution microscope was what Eric Betzig won his prize for. He comes from a very different perspective than most academics, and so I'm very interested to hear what he thinks of the future of research in academia. For me, one of the problems is that uh, the university isn't necessarily, it's a good system for education, but not necessarily an optimal system for research. The skill set to be an assistant professor is a different skill right. set than the skill set to be a postdoc. Mm -hmm. And some succeed at that transition and some don't, right. right? What would you change if you could wave a magic wand and oh, remake academia? I, I mean, I could rant for hours about <laughs> that. People are ignorant of exactly how rewarding these careers in industry yeah. can be yeah. Yeah. and how bright many of the people are in industry yeah. that mm -hmm. you work with. And right. You know, there just needs to be greater understanding of that as an alternative to the sort of, you know, heartbreak of banging your head against trying to get, trying to get a tenure yeah. track. I thought Eric Betzig was an interesting case because here's someone who describes himself as a tool builder yes. and his background is physics and he's made all these contributions to biology and to chemistry. And I think it shows how when you start from the foundation of one discipline, it's mm -hmm. very easy to branch out and solve really important problems, even when they don't occur within your discipline. Right. And I think um, he described one of the ways that he actually came up with the discovery, which mm -hmm. was in an interaction with biologists and understanding what are some of the tools that you've developed that can help me solve the problems of physics and chemistry. Well, one thing that was also very impressive was that he built his microscope in his friend's living room. And so you don't necessarily need a giant lab and all these fancy equipment. 
You just need your idea and the tenacity to really go after it and to figure out this problem that's perhaps puzzled people for a very long time. The beautiful baobab tree, or tree of life, is an African icon. The baobab fruit contains four times the potassium of banana, three times the vitamin C of an orange, and twice the calcium of spinach. But the baobab is an orphan. Science has paid little attention to this tree until now. The African Orphan Crops Consortium is harnessing the power of genetics for orphan crops. The baobab tree is the first of 101 plants to have its genome sequenced, assembled, and annotated. And the information will be made available to all unrestricted. Where millions of people are malnourished, this genetic data will help farmers provide the food they need. The genomes will guide African plant breeders so they can create crops that are higher yielding, water and nutrient use efficient, resilient to climate change, and full of nutrition triggering a huge leap forward for the diversity and sustainability of the continent's agriculture.